Okay, uh, thanks Phyllis uh, for that introduction. Uh, my name is again is Ian Hewitt. I am a NASA Solar System Ambassador. Uh, we're going to talk today about Pluto. For those of you that know me, you know I, I love talking about Pluto and uh, this uh, last uh, really few months has really been really fantastic. If you like talking about Pluto, there's been lots of interesting things. This is a brand new presentation. Uh, this is uh, basically collecting all the data uh, that's been published uh, so far and uh, that's actually been really challenging because new things come out almost every other couple days. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I last, at the end of last week I was almost caught up with everything and had made this presentation and then on uh, Monday afternoon I got a notification that the New Horizons team actually published a, a paper in Science Magazine with the preliminary, preliminary results and I actually went ahead and had to go and uh, and uh, catch up and add a few things and make a few changes. So uh, you know that's uh, this is the, the latest and freshest data, and probably will it, it will uh, change from now on. So uh, we thought we'd start with a, a quick recap of the mission. Uh, this is the first close-up look at a Kuiper Belt outer solar system object. You know we kind of astronomers kind of classify the uh, solar system into into like three zones. There's really the the inner uh, solar system, the rocky planets, then there's the outer uh, planets, which are the gas planets, and then there's really the, the Kuiper Belt objects in this, this, this outer solar system zone, and uh, Pluto's re the very first objects we've ever, uh, very first object, rather, we've ever looked at in the uh, outer solar system. Again, the so the closest approach, uh, really it was taking extensive data from about May through September. So I had a couple of really good months of science. It was moving very, very fast, so we couldn't really get any more data than that. Uh, this, type of, this type of mission is kind of, uh, uh, it's, it's a little bit different because we're not actually going and landing or going in orbit, so you kind of have to get as much as you can as you're flying by. So because of that, and the way the spacecraft is built, it's very small and light. It can't really talk back to Earth at the same time as it's taking data. So it really spent most of that time taking data, although you notice they did release pictures here, pictures there, uh, just to, you know, for interest's sake, they periodically would send a little data back. But most of the time it was spent taking, taking actual data. The actual download of the data, and it's over 50 gigabytes of data uh, that it took, actually started on, uh, you know, uh, October, I have October 1st, it should have been uh, September 1st, but uh, 2015. Um, and uh, th we, th we estimate at the rate it sends it back, which is really, really slow. It's sort of like, uh, you know, like an old AOL kind of dial-up modem, or a little bit less. Actually, a 9600 AOL modem would make it look really, would look really fast compared to it. it. It won't be completed until September 30th, 2016. So there's a lot more data that's going to come back. And you'll see I have a little bit on the, some of the moons, but a lot of the smaller moons, all that data is just still sitting on New Horizons waiting to come back. So we'll, we'll see a lot of cool stuff over the next year. Uh, what can I say about New Horizons? It's really, it, really was, it really was amazing. It's really a very apt name since it is the first time we're going out into the outer solar system. And again, just the data has been fantastic. Uh, I've seen things that say it was excitement cubed, which for the scientists, it really was very exciting. Whenever you get a first look at anything, it just, it's just really incredible. I, I thought I'd share a couple of things that I really like. Some of the scientists' comments in some of the blogs and everything uh, that I found, that, you know, that you see a lot of uh, headlines in news outlets that are, are kind of like have a lot of hyperbole. But when you look in the science blogs and they have like all this excitement, it's really kind of neat. You know, like I saw a lot of them that just said, wow. And they were like, it's really wowing us. And... Uh, uh, the other one is our jaw dropped. I saw that multiple times by the science team when they actually saw the data. That you, you know, they were just so surprised. But by and large, my absolute favorite one, and I'm sorry, I can't remember who actually coined this, but I, when I read it, I just was laughing. It said, okay, Pluto, now you're just showing off. You know? <laughs> because it just, it's not just one surprise or two surprises. There's a lot of things that just really, really amazing things. Uh, so I, I take it back to our last episode, which any of you that have seen any of my presentations or a lot of the, the NASA presentations before probably saw, saw this. Uh, you know, here's Pluto at the, be at the best Hubble Space Telescope resolution. With all the processing and everything, there you go. Uh, so you really can't learn much from that. I also kind of showed a picture. If you looked at our moon at the same resolution, that's what you would see. 
So this really was an amazing close-up look where we could learn a lot more. Previously, based on all that Hubble data and other ground-based data, we created a model of what Pluto looks like. And this is, this is what it was. Uh, again, this is all before New Horizons, so this was uh, just basically what they created. And they created a, a color surface map. And uh, this was a, another guess about what it might look like. It's actually kind of interesting because you can kind of see there, are, there were some accuracies in here, but you know, obviously didn't have any of the details. But now we really start learning something. And so we uh, have been getting some really terrific answers, but we're also getting a lot, a lot of really, quest really good questions about Pluto and a lot of surprises. And that's, that's what makes this kind of stuff really, really exciting is when you have like complete surprises and things that just go, you know, how, how is that happening? And we'll kind of go through that. So um, originally we said, there were a lot of people that said Pluto is just like a comet. You know, it's a dirty ice ball, dirty snowball. Uh, turns out that's not, not true at all. <laughs> that's, uh, that, that one's out the window. It says Pluto's, uh, the, the other school of thought was Pluto was uh, like Neptune's moon Triton. They said, well, if you look at Triton, it's very much like Pluto will probably see. And it turns out that uh, in actuality, Pluto couldn't be, couldn't be more different than Triton. They really are not. They're totally, they're whatever, they're totally different origins, different, different type, type of places. And then also Pluto, and, Pluto is just a barren, rocky world out there way at the edge of the solar system. Well, we know that's not correct either. So that's totally different. So uh, that's totally changing it. So this is uh, one of the newer images. Uh, this is actually a true color image of Pluto. And uh, you, know, it, it, you see a lot of the features that now people are starting to become familiar with from the press, like the, the heart or the, the Sputnik planum. Uh, you see the dark areas and the light areas. And, and some of the basic stuff we've learned is that we firmly established the size. That was always up for debate. And that's always important because you're trying to debate which is the largest object in the uh, Kuiper belt. So we now know exactly what it is. It turns out that it's actually in the range of estimate of size. It's actually in the high end of that range, right near the top. Um, it's not oblate, so it's pretty spherical. Now, what that means is uh, when it's mostly spherical and not kind of squished down, it means it didn't have a period in its history where it had like a really high spin rate, where it was spinning really fast, like Earth did. Uh, and other planets did because you, know, you kind of get a little of that with, with the other planets and then they kind of slow down. So that, that didn't happen. So it's got a little bit different history. Uh, it does have the highest albedo in the solar system, the highest albedo. It should be, that, it should be the highest albedo difference. Uh, and what that means is basically the reflectivity, how much light it reflects from the dark areas to the light areas. It's absolutely the highest in the solar system. Nobody else has that range of, of reflections. We're not really sure why that is, but it, it's got the very, very dark areas, very, 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 very light areas. And you can also see it's also got a lot of, a lot of cool colors we'll talk about in a second. It does have an ice-rich crust. This was not a surprise. We did believe that Pluto has probably as much water as Earth does, possibly more. Uh, it turns out that's, that was one prediction that was absolutely correct. One of the few, <laughs> other than it is round, and that was another. Uh, we, one thing that what, uh, was a surprise is they took the bulk densities of, uh, of Pluto and Charon, and they are very close to each other, like less than 10% difference. Uh, and from some of those studies, they think that there's likely not a lot of differentiation in the planet, which means you know that, that, that when you get differentiation, like a lot of the inner planets took so long to cool that all the heavy, a lot of heavy elements settled inside the planets and the lighter ones on top. We now think that's not the case, that we used to think Pluto was differentiated and Charon wasn't, but the, the latest data kind of leads us to believe that's not the case. So Pluto is kind of more mixed up, if you will. That also talks about, points to some clues about how it possibly formed, uh, meaning it probably didn't form inside the solar system where it was, or close in the solar system where it was able to heat up. Uh, you, so looking at the colors, that's one thing you notice right away, it's got like, yellows, and a lot of reds. And even the, the predicted maps were red. And the reason that is it's something called Tholins. Um, and I, probably a lot of you remember, uh, and probably when you were in school, there were, the, this was, there were these Miller-Urey experiments. Uh, it, I originally done back in the 50s. And this is where they, they basically wanted to try to see if you could kind of 
you know, uh, cause organic molecules to be created and life to get started on an early Earth. So they kind of pushed in a bunch of um, a bunch of uh, you know basic gases, and they basically shot electricity and static through there and and tried to uh, see what molecules would form. Uh, so it was, and they, they they did a lot of work on Titan's chemistry with this. Um, and you may have seen this because, again, in your science classes, I remember seeing a lot when I was in high school saying, oh, yeah, they're trying to show that, you know, life can just spontaneously be created. And well, they never really, I guess they, you did see amino acids created. I guess it never really got all the way on the life. But it actually created a lot of interesting things. And Carl Sagan and uh, Bishwankari actually invented the name Tholins for the chemicals that were created. What happens is as you get these ultraviolet rays coming in from the sun, uh, it actually kind of breaks up some of the like nitrogen and methane, and then it recombines, and it can recombine into these really long chain uh, molecules. Uh, and so these molecules tend to come out yellow, red, and some of them are black. And that's, but a lot of them come out red. In fact, uh, we've, we've even produced them in the lab. This is some that they made at Johns Hopkins. Um, and so that's why we thought Pluto would be red and probably, and why it is, so. So one of the things we also looked at was Pluto does have methane. That's one of the, the components of the atmosphere. So we kind of looked at the distribution and this is uh, another, this is where the surprises start coming in because you can kind of see, and this is not the data for the whole globe. It's really the, this section here to the left. And where you see really heavy purple, you have a really high concentration of methane. Where you see the black, you've got virtually none. So what we're seeing is a really kind of spotty distribution and one that doesn't look random, right? It's not just like random spots. You know, it kind of looks like it kind of tracks some of the topography. So this is one of the questions of, you know, okay, why is the methane distributed in the fashion that it is? And why does it appear to be more regional and not just kind of smoothly all over the place? So this was a, another one of those surprises. So this is, uh, this is actually a really new image. I think it, it came out uh, either Monday or Friday. And this is part of the surface, uh, and this is the highest res image that they have. And it doesn't look quite as good here as it does if you pull it up on your monitor. But you can see um, you know, the, the Sputnik planum, and you can see you know, the, the difference between the, the, how bright that is and how dark this is, and then the northern hemisphere here. And one thing you notice, and this is, uh, this is one of the most important things about doing flybys is one of the ways you infer a lot from the planet is by looking at the terrain and looking at things like craters and cratering rates. And Pluto has a, a very, very diverse uh, terrain in terms, of, in terms of cratering rates. Like you see areas with absolutely like no craters, like Sputnik Planum. And you know, this area up here, I'm trying to remember the name of it. I'm still getting used to all the names, uh, that top area. But then you see other, others that have a, a, a fair amount of craters. Uh, obvious craters, but even in those, there's some they're, they're degraded. Now, what that kind of tells us is that you would ordinarily expect with Pluto hanging out there for a couple billion years, you'd, you'd want to, you'd expect to see a lot of craters on top of craters, sort of like the Moon. Um, certainly not like that. So, some something is actually working to resurface and erode the crater, craters. So, this is one of our first clues that Pluto is actually active, and there's actually some some resurfacing going on especially in these areas that have no, no craters. And there's, there's actually some very active processes going on. We also see, uh, definitely see exposed water ice. And this is a picture, and the, the blue is not a real color. It's just kind of highlighted blue, so it's easier to see. If you look at the raw image, it's kind of really hard to see. But we see just exposed water ice. But even there, why is it only exposed in some places? Uh, it seems like it's it's... It's tied in somehow to the features, but we're not really sure how. And the other thing is the ice is red. So is there some kind of interaction with tholins? And that would be, I mean, it's always possible that you could freeze things out, but ice at, um, water is a really unique substance. And it has, uh, we have like three common phases here on Earth, you know, li liquid, water, it's either ice or it's water vapor or it's liquid. But actually there are like 17 distinct phases of water. Most of them are solid phases, depending on pressure and temperature. And some of these are as hard as rock and, and, work, like, and work like really hard rock. So they don't really infiltrate like, like water, like ice in your refrigerator. 
So the good question, the question is kind of why is why is that ice really red? Is it okay, especially since these Tholins wouldn't have been around when the when Pluto was formed? It was some they're somehow getting into the water, the water ice that's exposed. So that's that's another one of the questions we want to try to figure out. There are ice mountains and cliffs. I really like this picture because I think it shows them really well. You will see in all the pictures of Pluto, as it flew over, you get different angles of sunlight. So they, they kind of use different pictures to look at different features. But uh, you can see these, uh, these mountains. And these are, these, some of these are like two and three kilometers tall. So they're not small. Frank, sorry. Uh, the, that image there, is that an actual visual so the question is, is that an actual visual image? I, I repeat the questions because I am recording on my laptop tonight. So, uh, yes, that's an actual, that's an actual visual image. I say I've got that in my four by six and that'll be my next poster. Uh, it's a, it's, it's a really terrific image because you, you can really see, uh, the ice cliffs. Well, if you, uh, don't flick, push the button, you can really see, see the tremendous ice cliffs and these are ice. We know what we do know is they're not, they're not like methane and the gases. And the reason we, we know that is because you, you can't make mountains like that with uh, methane and gases. They just won't hold together. They won't support those kind of structures. Uh, there's also really, really dark areas. And these are, these, are, these are actually being kind of carefully studied. You see these really heavyweight black areas. And there, we think this is kind of a clue to what's going on or the activity in, in Pluto. We think it may be a sign of active geologic processes. So we actually think Pluto may have like some kind of uh, tect tectonics, more like Earth going on. And actually, th this is upwelling from the interior. Uh, that's still a theory, but uh, we think that this may be one of the signs of things that are actually like, kind of bubbling up. You know? Y yes, Mike. Yeah, were they able to measure? Uh, yeah, they were able to do some measurements of the height. Uh, and like the, the, the ice mountains are like about two to three kilometers high. And then there's some other, they, they have height on other things. And But I, I confess, I, I actually didn't look that up, like in terms of how deep the craters were and everything. It's a good question. But, so the, the, but the thing is, so this may be a very key part of the geologic process. Because Pluto is actually turning out to be a very, very active place. Things are actually going on. Uh, it's, it, it turns out that Pluto is actually in the solar system one of the closest analogs to Earth uh, that we that that we have. It's probably closer to Earth than any other planet, which I thought was kind of totally ironic at the end of the end of the day. Um, some other things we see that uh, kind of support that. If you look at well, obviously my animation wasn't working here. Uh, these are this is another overhead shot of the uh, ice mountains, uh, and then this is kind of a close up of ice mountains and in the middle of this uh, field. It's kind of like got dunes and it looks like uh, wind and the dunes and ridges and it looks like it has the ripples, like wind-like. So, and it, yeah, well, I guess it does look like a Klingon battle cruiser, Steve. That's a good one. Uh, but it, you, this looks like a wind-blowing desert. This shows some, and the features are rounded and eroded. So it actually shows active processes going on here. Now, so it's not just a case of just you know, a bunch of frozen out static things. So that that's really interesting. If you look a little more carefully at Sputnik Planum, Mike. So uh, you had mentioned about uh, obviously it acted in some manner, but previously you had mentioned that it wasn't very differentiated as far as its mass. So they had any clue what it could be causing tectonic pressure or Oh, that's a very good question, and that's one of the big questions. As the question is, we mentioned that it wasn't very differentiated, uh, but yet it appears to be very active. What is the process behind that? That's an excellent question, and one of the big questions about Pluto. What is driving it? There's actually, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, but there's actually, there's nothing could be drive. There's, there's nothing that we know that could be driving it right now. So we've got to figure out what's actually causing Pluto to actually be this way. I mean, it's a couple billion years old. It should have all settled out, and sunlight's not enough to get that going. But if you go to a Sputnik plan, and you may have seen and heard a lot about the snakeskin image, and this is kind of a, a picture of the snakeskin right here. And you see, it's got a lot of pitting. 
uh, in there. And we think that's because there's actually uh, some volatiles or volatile gases or atmosphere that are actually kind of evaporating. But when you look here, you see uh, on Sputnik Planet, you see these like these ovoid and uh, uh, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the little, the little uh, ridges and everything that are kind of in like the shapes of polygons and everything. Um, so that, that all seems to really support that there's, there's volatile ices and there's some kind of evaporation process and deposition process going on, which is actually pretty cool. Um, we, we wonder if it's driven by solid state convection. And what solid state convection is, this is the same type of process that goes on in Earth that uh, causes the plate tectonics, you know, with the, where the, uh, uh, the, the, not necessarily just magma, but like uh, there's actually like a slow convection inside the earth it sort of drives like the spreading of the plates and drives the tectonics. So this kind of looks a lot like that. But again, back to Mike's question, how do you get that effect in apparently undifferentiated planet? Maybe it is differentiated or maybe there's something else. Maybe there's a lot of residual heat inside Pluto. Maybe a lot of radioactive heat. Uh, we, don't, we don't really know. Uh, but we do know that it's definitely in motion. So we talk a little bit more about uh, Sputnik Planum and talk about the glaciers. So what we believe, we talked about the fact that there's no craters here. We think what this, that what you got here is some very large glaciers. Um, that are, but they're glaciers, they're not of uh, water ice, they're glaciers of, you know, like the volatile ices because it's a lot colder there. So what I did is I went ahead and, and kind of uh, got a more close up image. And here's one, and what we think is, here's the actual glacier part itself you know, that gets deposited there. And what we're, what's, act, what, what's happening is the glacier is kind of flowing and actually carving out channels and eroding features, much like the glaciers kind of, you know, get, get deposited on top of on Earth and then they sort of like kind of push out to the ocean. We think that's kind of doing the same thing. And obviously there's not really an ocean, but um, we really do see this. And put another picture in, kind of give you a little bit different view of... Uh, the glacier, this is really, this is what I talked about when I said that uh, different angles of sunlight show you different things. So this is the same view, but from a much different angle of sunlight. So you can kind of see a little bit more, but you can kind of see where this really is a, a kind of a, a channel being carved out. So what you have, like uh, you are correct, Steve. Steve, Steve say, uh, Steve's comment was it looked like an alluvial fan and, and, and correct. It is, it looks very much like the water uh, erosion feature, the water cycle features on Earth that's going on. And so that, that could be one of the things that's doing a lot of the resurfacing on planet, resurfacing on Pluto. Um, so we not, but the, also the other, the, the other clue is could, could this, uh, you know, the, the round part here be actually connected to the deep interior and this be some kind of upwelling that's upwelling and then forcing, forcing the volatile ices to flow until they evaporate. Again, good question. Probably won't know the answer until we can go back to Pluto. Probably be more than a few years before we do that, but uh, there's a lot of people actually looking at, uh, looking at this type of stuff. Phyllis. Is there an infrared instrument on New Horizons? Uh, there was an infrared instrument on New Horizons. So we know the temperatures of these different areas. We know the temperatures of the areas. I'm not sure if all that data has been downloaded yet. I'm not sure if I've seen the temperature, so that, may, that, that information may still be sitting on the spacecraft. But we do, one of, that's one of the things we really wanted to identify was the, the uh, temperatures of the various areas. And I, I, I don't remember seeing that in any of the papers, so maybe they don't have it, so it's a good question though. But, so we think there's a very good possibility there's like some kind of hydrological cycle going on on Pluto, except not with water, but with the ball of ices. And this is again, the same thing we have going here on Earth, where you get, uh, you know, like you, you get precip precipitation. Not that it really rains on Pluto, but it kind of more like probably kind of sublimates out and, and kind of falls down uh, in the evening. And there's a lot of data that kind of shows when you look at the atmosphere that it's thicker in the, in the evening than it is in the morning. So uh, it kind of shows that uh, there's a possibility that you're getting a lot of the equivalent of dew kind of falling out and then it sort of gets kind of evaporates during the day and that it's also some of it may 
it would be flowing out through these, these glaciers and then into, uh, into various areas and then evaporating. But you basically got some kind of active cycle, hydrological cycle going on, but with these ices, which uh, this is actually a really huge surprise. Uh, again, the question is what's driving it? Is the sun's energy enough to just drive this or is there something else driving it? Probably, some, probably a combination of the two. So, and another really good question, but this is definitely one of the big surprises. Speaking of atmosphere, I'm sure everybody's seen uh, this top picture if you've been following Pluto, the blue haze. So Pluto, Pluto actually has like a blue atmosphere. Um, so uh, which is, this was a little bit of a surprise. Earth has one too. Uh, Mars has a red atmosphere. What causes that is really the size of the particles in the atmosphere. The Earth's atmosphere has a lot of nitrogen particles, and it tends to uh, do a lot of Rayleigh scattering of the, uh, of the blue light. Uh, Mars has much bigger particles, so you get red light. But uh, Pluto has uh, also small particles, and so you get this really nice blue haze. So the, that's the, the sunlit view of it, which is kind of neat. But the other thing is we wanted to look a lot. The reason we, we flew behind Pluto is we wanted to try to identify how far out the atmosphere goes. Uh, you know, our models originally had it going out well, about 170 kilometers. That's this blue, blue area here. And this is based on a lot of the uh, occultation data that we've taken with the Hubble and some other telescopes, you know, looking at the light curve. Um, but it turns out that was uh, kind of way off <laughs> by at least a factor of six or seven because it turns out uh, Pluto's atmosphere goes out over a thousand miles, which is, uh, or a thousand kilometers, sorry, not miles. Um, this, is, uh, th this, was, this was actually another really huge surprise. Um, and you can kind of see that uh, uh, this is the data from New Horizons when it passed through there. So it turns out that Pluto's atmosphere is one of the most extensive relatively in the solar system. So if you, if you were to scale this up to Earth size, it would mean the Earth's atmosphere would go out much, much farther than it does. So this is a big surprise as to why there is so much atmosphere present. And you can see a lot of it is, a lot of it's thin and tenuous, but it's there. And you can see that really, when you get to the original measurements, you can see it really kind of, it really kind of troughs down. So that's really the thicker part of the atmosphere. That's what we were detecting from our instruments here uh, on Earth. So that's one of the reasons I guess we actually go to these, uh, these objects so we can actually see them. So uh, again, the blue haze uh, is evidence of really small particles in the atmosphere. Uh, much the, you know, the, it's much larger than pre predicted. The other thing that was really very, very, very interesting, especially if you're into planetary science, which I know a lot of you are, is that uh, what they call Pluto's tail. And you may have seen that you know Pluto wags its tail. There's been a lot of jokes in the in the media and the blogs about this, in that Pluto has this tremendous uh, ionized tail coming off of it from the solar wind. The solar wind is just what comes off the sun, the highly charged particles uh, that come off the sun and kind of just like kind of blow out in all directions and basically kind of uh, sweep things away. So what you're seeing is where the solar wind's hitting it, you're getting a shock. This is very, very common for all the planets. But then you're seeing that you're seeing the slowed wind come around it, and then, but you're also seeing the nitrogen atmosphere, a bunch of nitrogen ions being detected behind it, which means they're being stripped off. This is a process called, that has a highly technical name, of sputtering. And it's where um, you get uh, like ultraviolet radiation from the sun that ionizes uh, the atmosphere particles, like ionizes the nitrogen, and then the solar wind will kind of come and kind of grab them and take them off. Um, so we, 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 we expected that. We expected that there was probably some you know, a atmospheric escape, but this is far, more than, far, far more than we expected. In fact, this is hundreds of tons of nitrogen a day that's being lost. Uh, by Pluto, so it's it's very. In, in fact, it's it's a lot it's a lot more Mars-like in the way it loses its atmosphere. It's a lot closer to Mars than it is anything else. Yes. Uh, so the question uh, was, Pluto doesn't have a magnetic field. No, not that we know of, and I haven't seen any of the the data that would suggest that it does have a magnetic field. So the magnetic field would, would protect 
would be have a far more protective effect. So, Mike. And to follow up on that, it doesn't have a lot of gravity to hold on to the atmosphere. It does not. It does not have a, a lot of gravity. There must be something replenishing it. So that's one of the big questions: is where is all this nitrogen coming from? It is not possible for Pluto to be losing this much nitrogen, you know, over the billions of years. Something is replenishing the nitrogen. And we don't know what that is, whether it's some kind of upwelling from the interior or what, but it, it does support there's some kind of active process on Pluto that's happening because it can't just be a static process of just slowly evaporating away. That it's, that the, the numbers just don't add. Yes. Right, so th yeah, the comment was that you're able to keep long molecules for a long period of time because it's so incredibly cold. That's correct, and we'll, we'll look at that with, with Karen. Uh, you're talking about things like cold trapping and everything. Yes, so a lot of the tholins and everything aren't really going anywhere because it's, it's so cold, they, they just don't get, get warm enough. Uh, but there is, and you're also absolutely correct that, that it has to do with the energy of the particles. And when you actually look at these atmospheres, you, know, you, see, the, you see a wide variety of energies in, in, in atmospheres, and it kind of follows this distribution that kind of looks like a curve like that. It's actually called a Maxwellian distribution for anybody that's math-oriented. Um, and what can happen is that another process, which we think is also happening in Pluto, is the sun's energy can kind of accelerate some of those particles and they can actually get enough energy to actually escape. That's called hydrodynamic escape. You may have seen a lot of that in the Pluto as well. They're trying to decide if that's going on as well. But you're right, Jerry, it is very cold there, and it does, it does help them keep a lot of the molecules there, which is another reason of, okay, why are we losing so much nitrogen? Well, I'm sorry. It, so that actually supports the fact that it's nitrogen, not these like long chain molecules that are coming off. Steve? So that's, that's, a great, that's a great point. I was about to bring that up. What we don't know is whether this is a function of when Pluto is close in. It's one data point, as Steve points out. Uh, we did, when we took the Earth-based data uh, for Pluto's atmosphere, that was many years ago. Pluto was farther out, away from the sun. Does that have a difference? There are some people that have argued that. Uh, so it could be that it just does this when it's close in. But even if it's doing it when it's close in, it's a lot of nitrogen loss. They, they think you know, it has something to do. It's another clue that there's some kind of active process going on. But, so I kind of talked a lot about that. The big question is, where does it come from? So this is one of the, one of the real big questions. Now, the other thing you also see that was actually a big surprise, and this is an, we saw this image before, but what I didn't point out, and I don't know whether you can see it, because frankly, the lights that are shining on me are very, very bright, and so it's like really hard for me to see the screen. <laughs> but if you look um, uh, in here, you see specific layers. You see horizontal layers in the atmosphere, and they're very distinct. And this was very surprised. So we actually see this, these layers setting up in the atmosphere, and we think it's like some kind of atmospheric wave, uh, which I, I guess the, the most closest analog is like, when you have weather, like you have like high pressure areas or low pressure areas in the Earth's atmosphere, you can kind of, it kind of sets up like an atmospheric wave. Uh, Jerry can probably tell me more about that, but that's what, um, that's what we think is happening. We see these really distinct haze layers and the structure, and, and they've unro they unroll it usually when they see, they, they take it all the way around Pluto and then they kind of unroll it flat so they can study it, and it is very, very straight and horizontal. So again, some, there are some active processes going on in the atmosphere. That, Steve? That image, it's not really, I'm trying to look, trying to get my head wrapped around the perspective here. It's not like layers in an onion. You're actually looking at a part of the sky, almost like cirrus clouds would look like in our sky. You are, yeah, you are, yeah, so the question is, okay. you're almost, it's really what you're looking at there, it's like part of the sky. Direct. Yeah, you're looking to tilt it up. This, so you're actually looking like to get the clouds. And this is actually kind of a clip out of an image, cool but yeah. Because that means there's differences in latitude as well as... 
there, there does appear to be differences, uh, you know, and, and so that's, uh, it, it's almost like weather for lack of a better, better term. It's almost like weather or some form of it, albeit, again, this is not water vapor. These are what astronomers call ices and astronomers tend to uh, classify things. Uh, they, they, they tend to classify things into, into groups that are useful for them. And really, you know, like, uh, when, when you talk about like stars and they have metals in stars, really anything other than hydrogen and helium is considered a metal to an astronomer. <laughs> and then ices are really any of these compounds, uh, you know, nitrogen, methane, they're all kind of clumped clump together in ices because it's kind of the, they kind of do that for convenience. So well, we, think it's, we think it's these kind of ices that are certainly there, but there's obviously some kind of interaction going on. The other thing we see is that is not just a phenomenon, Steve, to go back to your question. Great straight man, thank you. Is that that is not just a high level phenomena. We actually see this kind of haze in a very low level. And this is, um, this is a view, and it's a little hard to see, um, but this is a view of low level haze. And you're actually seeing, if you can kind of see these little streaks, they don't look like they're showing up very well for me, but uh, these are like crepuscular rays. So this is like when you look at the sun and you, you see the rays coming, the, ray, the rays coming up. You know, it's always really spectacular. I love when that happens here. But so you're actually seeing that there, and we're seeing these very long streaks, you know, near dusk uh, on Pluto. So we're actually seeing that there is like a low-level haze or fog in some areas. Again, it's very regional that you're getting. So the question is, this is a function of where things are evaporating? or but So that structure of the atmosphere just doesn't exist at the top layers. It exists all the way through it. And let's talk about Karen a little bit. Uh, this was also another, another really terrific, <laughs> terrific batch of surprises. Uh, this is this is Pluto's moon. It's not as big as it's not as big as Pluto, but it's it's fairly large. It's it's much larger than our moon compared to, compared to us. So that's why you get that that the, when you see Pluto orbit, and you may have seen some of the early pictures where it's actually kind of orbiting. That the center of the the orb uh, of the orbit between Pluto and Charon is really in between the two planets. So they sort of dance around each other. Um, so we, we there is no atmosphere at all on Charon. That's not a surprise. We kind of expected that. So I kind of checked okay by that. That's one thing that we were correct. There's really no detectable atmosphere there. Uh, we expected a heavily cratered object. Again, a moon. We said, oh, it's a moon, right? It's going to look like the moon, right? It's going to have lots of craters and, you know, kind of really beaten up terrain. Uh, we don't actually see that as much as we thought. If you kind of look at it, uh, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot more remodeling going on in a lot of this terrain than we would have expected. So there's obviously a process going on here that, that's remodeling it. Especially, you know, you look down here, this is actually relatively smooth from what we would expect. So something has, has been resurfacing the planet or resurfacing the moon. So that was definitely a surprise. So we didn't also didn't expect all the canyons, mountains, landslides, as well as the remodeling. So there's actually a lot, there's actually a, a lot of evidence of some geologic activity, not as much as Pluto itself, but there's something going on here. So the biggest, the biggest thing you notice, if you look at this, I call it the crack in the world, right, is what most people notice is this. All the way through the equatorial region, there's a huge, massive valley, uh, valley system, valley fracture type structure system. And um, so that, um, uh, it actually, it's a little hard to see from this view with uh, the uh, angle, but it's actually a lot like Valles Marineris on Mars. So it's, it's, it's got this huge crack going around. Uh, so that, that's really kind of strange. We, we think it's related to the remodeling. We think it's evidence of cryovolcanism. All that means is it's basically um, uh, like, like volcanic activity, but it's actually a, a water-based magma instead of rock-based. And you see this in some of, the, some of the other moons of the solar system. You see like these ice volcanoes that, sh that shoot up water and ice. Um, we think that's what, that's what was actually causing like a lot of the remodeling here, that there was actually uh, some, uh, I see John, there was actually some uh, water, water-based magma. John? Uh, 
Well, that's a great question. <laughs> so the question is, um, do the... Uh, uh, do, do the gravitational forces between Pluto and Charon, because they do orbit around each other, drive a lot of this activity? That's a really good question, and that would be the first thing you would think of. Uh, however, that's actually not the case because all the orbital eccentricities between the two, they're so tightly locked, and all the orbital eccentricities are completely damped that there's actually no way for that to be the driving force, right? It, it's not like when you have the, the moons going around you know, like Jupiter and Saturn that are getting pushed and pulled, they're creating a lot of heat and driving a lot of the forces, that actually the dynamics and supported by New Horizon do not show that as a possibility. So that's, that's a great question. And that's one of the things that's really puzzling about, about well, where, where this energy or where, what's driving the system. I'm sorry, it's a little hard. The, the acoustics seem to make it a little hard to hear. Oh, they're completely tidally locked. So the question is, are they tidally locked? Yes, they are completely tidally locked, completely synced. So they don't, yeah, you, you would not see a different side. So they're, they're just very tightly locked. So one of, the, one of the things that we think may be responsible for this massive fracture zone in the equatorial region is that there might have been liquid water at one time on Karen. And it basically kind of froze out. So it's sort of like if you take a, uh, take a bottle of water and put it in your freezer for long enough, if, you, if the bottle of water is full enough, and I don't know if any of you found that out like I have, it'll actually kind of break open, break open the bottle. So we think that's kind of maybe what's going on, what, what kind of caused a lot of, that, a lot of that. And it's possible when that was happening, that's when you got a lot of the cryovolcanism uh, to help do the remodeling. Yes, sir. That's, a, that's another really great question. Is there any way to determine the age of the features like that? And that's very hard to do with a flyby. Now, one of the reasons that we look at craters so much is we have to kind of infer the ages from the cratering rate. So that, that's a really good question. And they can look at some of the chemical data, but by and large, uh, there's a lot of inferences you have to draw from a flyby. That's why it would be great to send, it would be awesome to actually be able to send something actually like a probe there that could actually land there because you could actually do a lot more uh, type of measurement. That's a really, really, all, all, these are great questions. The red spot, the other thing that really jumps out at you is the red spot at the, at the top. And this is in the North Polar region of Karen. And obviously, this is a, this is a, these are true color images that we're looking at. So there's obviously really uh, a, a tremendous concentration up there. So it's distinctly red. We think it's likely these tholins again. Uh, and what we think's happening is, go back to kind of Jerry's question, is that what's happening is as the atmosphere is coming off Pluto, especially because the atmosphere is so wide, that there's a bit of cold trapping going on. And this is, this is where um, it gets very, very cold on the northern polar region of Karen. Uh, you know, it's darn near absolute zero. Um, and we think what's happening is some of the atmosphere from Pluto is getting trapped in, the, in, the, in, that, in that massive crater, in that basin. And then what happens is it gets a little bit of sun, and you get some, some dolan creation, but then the atmosphere will go ahead, uh, uh, but the, the, the temperature will get just warm enough for that Pluto atmosphere to kind of escape as a vapor. But the tholins you have to have a lot higher temperature to get them to sublimate, and that's not happening. So what's happening is it's slowly kind of building up over time. So that's, that's what we think is happening there. Again, a lot of this is uh, all you know, theoretical until we analyze the rest of the data. I also put in the moon Nix. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of Pluto's smaller moons, uh, the data is still sitting on New Horizons, and we haven't seen them. There is some better data. So this is not exactly going to be the, the high, high resolution images. We're still kind of waiting for those. I, did, I have been checking. I was hoping they'd come across this week, but they haven't. Um, so you can kind of see uh, they're, they're pretty much as expected. They're not large enough to really kind of have hydrostatic equilibrium, or basically that's enough gravity to pull themselves into a ball. They're kind of you know potato kind of shaped. Um, but what, one thing we noticed is that uh, we noticed the reddish again. So there's Tholins. Again, maybe a little cold trapping. Not really sure. 
sure what's going on. But the, the weird thing about it, we've already noticed, is um, the albedo or the reflectivity is even higher than Pluto. They are very, very, very shiny and bright. Uh, very unusually so, and we're not really sure why that is, and we're hoping some of the high-res data will help. I don't know if it's uh, like they're covered with some kind of glacier-type thing, although it's probably not moving, but there's some kind of glacier. We're not really sure about that. So really, that, that kind of brings us to uh, like our changing view of Pluto. So now we talked about the, the view of Pluto. We had all the things that wasn't like, not like a comet. It's not like Triton, Frank. Yeah, how you categorize? Yeah, how you categorize things is kind of a kind of a kind of a separate discussion. Almost, you know, almost not as exciting as some of the stuff going on at, at, at Pluto. But yeah, um, and I do have a whole talk on is Pluto a planet. So that you know, if if, if someday if we're we're short a speaker, I'll be glad to give it. That's that's actually an hour long discussion. <laughs> um, so our changing view of Pluto, our changing view of Pluto is Pluto is completely different from Triton. We now know that it's not it, it's not the same. You can't can't draw the same inference, inferences or conclusions at all. Uh, we know it's geologically active. Does it have any some kind of tectonics or is there something kind of else go, else going on? But it certainly has to be active. You just there's no other way to get the features. So check check on that. Uh, Pluto ha has likely I should put likely has a hydrological cycle going on, which actually you know almost like weather like Earth's having, which is, is kind of really strange. Um, and Pluto has a dynamic atmosphere, actually, when it's what's moving and setting up with structures. Uh, again, check. So really, it turns out that Pluto, more than any other planet, is much more like Earth and Mars, in fact, frankly, like Earth, than any, any other, whether you consider it a planet or a Kuiper Belt object or whatever it is. As an object, it's much closer to Earth than it is any other planet, which I think is a really great, it was a great result. It's a very surprising result. It's not something that we expected. And it's, it's kind of ironic, given the fact that it's been the, the subject of a lot of controversy, that it, it's really this different object. So uh, I've got not only a check there, but I've got the old uh, ad thing about it's priceless. <laughs> so uh, you know, we're looking forward to learning a lot more about Pluto. But the questions we talked about that, like the, the biggest one is, why is Pluto so active? Uh, you know, based on the current our current understanding, it shouldn't be. It should be a lot more static, but it's not. It's actually active and moving around. So, what drives that? What's the mechanism? You know, there's there's got to be something. Is it residual heat? Maybe a lot of radioactive elements uh, inside Pluto that's kind of driving it, or is there some other set of forces um, that are driving it? It's something we just don't understand. Is there actually solid state convection going on inside? Uh, some different form of solid state convection. Uh, maybe because it's not differentiated, there's some kind of chemical driver that's actually driving things to the surface. Again, don't really know. Uh, is there actually, you know, significant upwelling? Maybe that's just what's going on. Um, so why is Pluto so diverse? You know, again, w there's a lot of, I, I think it's very important to note that it's not consistent. Pluto's not consistent across the whole planet. If there is like the way the methane distributes, the way the colors are. It's very diverse, and that's very strange. It's not random. So it looks like something or some part of the process, or some clue is causing that, that to happen. So the question is, why is that? Um, and where is the nitrogen coming from? That's, a, that's another really big one. As much as it's losing, uh, something has to be replenishing the nitrogen. It's coming from somewhere. Uh, yeah, Mike, I think. It's, Did, did New Horizons have a radiation measuring instrument? Uh, you caught me on the hop on that one. I actually don't know if it had a radiation measuring instrument or not. Steve thinks it did, so. Well, I know it, I know it measured the ultraviolet. I know it was ultraviolet. I, I, I don't know, Mike. I can, I can find out and post that.
Sure. Uh, and Well, so the question is that, yeah, some, um, there are some the radioactive decay produces byproducts and maybe that's, that's part of the process. It's, it's not out of the question that you've got something like that going on. Uh, it, it, you know, again, that's, that's one of the things that there'll be a lot of people studying, probably be several PhD theses coming off about that. Uh, there's a lot of people studying Pluto right now and trying to determine what this data means. So when we get the rest of the data and they'll have to come out with some theories. They, they may know... In the first paper, again, the first paper they published by the team, they made no attempt to explain that. Uh, it, the papers, it's online, you can read it, it's Science Magazine. It deals more with the methodology of how they took a lot of the data, uh, and they didn't really draw a lot, they, they didn't really draw a lot of conclusions, they just point out the obvious things, but they say there's, there's more to come. So, it'd be really interesting over the course of the next year to see that, but it's, it's a good question. Uh, and the last one is, how and when did it form? And that's kind of a larger question. We kind of would like to really understand this outer solar system, you know, how and when they formed, right? You know, it's a key to how the, the solar system kind of evolved, right? We, we, we're looking at a lot of this. That's one of the reasons we're sending Juno back to Jupiter, try to understand whether it's got a solid core or whether it's uh, not, a, not a solid core. That actually has a lot of implications for the, solar, the formation of the solar system as well. So the question is, is Pluto something that formed close in, and migrated out, or is it something that just got created in the outer part of the solar system, and that's why its processes are so different? Uh, it's not differentiated, which seems to indicate that it cooled. If it, if it turns out the data continues to support that's not differentiated, means it, it didn't stay warm for a long period of time. Uh, so that, that would indicate it's possible it formed farther out and didn't form close in. Now the belief is that a lot of the objects in the Kuiper belt, uh, you know, were formed and kind of pushed out there. Uh, and then and that's, even a lot of them may have formed in the inner solar system and got ejected out by gravitational interactions. Um, and you can look at that because so many of them are like tidally locked with Neptune and Uranus, and we believe Neptune and Uranus probably changed places at one point. But the question is, you know, is that, is Pluto one of these objects or is Pluto something different? So we can say, stay tuned. <laughs> I'm sorry. Sure, Steve. Related to the data that it collected, and I'm curious, how do you know how was it just written onto a hard drive and now they're reading it off and it was all written onto a jumble? Or is there some kind of hierarchy and they're like going after a certain data first that's more important to them? So it's uh, stored, it is stored, uh, it's not really a hard drive, it's, it's sort of like, uh, you know, rad hardened flash it's memory. Solid, solid but so, solid state storage um, that, it, that it, it was stored on, it was all recorded onto the, onto the spacecraft. Uh, in terms of how they prioritize pulling the data off, that's a good question. I honestly don't know the answer. It's the first time anyone's asked. I never I'm thought to look it up. If they even could. I, I, I think there may be, my, my gut feeling is that there's some things that they were able to pull off selectively that they wanted to try to do, like some of these really pretty color pictures. So, you know, for obviously because everybody's really interested. But I suspect a lot of the other data is just coming off uh, sequentially. So some of the esoteric scientific data would be Right, and you know, they're, 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 I think they they pulled off a fair amount of data so far, but still, there's there's well in excess of 40 gigabytes of data to come off. So yeah, I mean, there's still six or eight months. Yeah, months of data. Uh, probably almost closer to a year. That's a lot. That's a lot of data. Because it's it's transmitted uh, it's transmitted multiple times. Uh, even though there are error correction codes, I mean that the power in the spacecraft is not not very high. I mean, the, this RTG that powers the spacecraft, um, you know, is about a thousand is about a thousand watts generically, but that only generates about a hundred watts of electricity. Most of which, it, a lot of a lot of the, a lot of it's used to heat the spacecraft. But I mean, really, it's only a couple of watts radio transmitter. So, yeah, it's very it's very small. So it's it's actually very slow. Uh, so the round trip time, yeah, it's somewhere in the. I think it's somewhere. I think it's I think it's somewhere in eight hours. 
If you go on the new if you go on the New Horizon website, I see your your hand raised, Carl. Uh, I, 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 uh, if you go on the New Horizon website, there's a picture of where where is it now. It shows you in real time where it is, and it talks about the round trip light time. Um, Carl, yeah. sir. Ah, okay. So the question is the air pressure of the surface uh, at Pluto. Not much, uh, about 10 microbars. So uh, with a bar obviously being equivalent to the uh, atmospheric pressure at sea level here on Earth. So 10 microbars is not a lot. It's thin. <laughs> Don. Right. So the question is, you know, is it possible that is it possible that cold accretion is responsible for the formation of Pluto? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of uh, the early solar system is a very active um, field of study. Uh, you know, we, we, we had these models for years about how the solar system forms. And we said, oh, these rocky planets form inside and the, the, the gas giants form out here um, and they throw the little pieces out. And we were really happy with that, and it seemed to be really consistent. But to point out, I think it was uh, Mike or somebody that pointed out, we had a data point of one <laughs> with our solar system. And now that we found all these exoplanets and these exoplanet solar systems, and we realized that that, that same lo that logic really doesn't hold true. So there's different models and how they form. Uh, cold accretion is one that's possible. So that's one of the things we'd really like to understand. And Pluto. Things like Pluto are keys to kind of understanding how our solar system evolved, right? You know, whether these kind of things can happen. The more we learn, the more questions we have, which is what kind of really shows good science. I, oh, I'm sorry, Matt. So Thanks, Matt. <laughs> Well, that's a great question. You know, where, where is it going next? When will it get there? Uh, and, you know, do we expect the objects to be the same? Uh, you know, I, I can't, it, it's going to be a while before it gets to the next Kuiper Belt object. They've identified a couple of potential targets. They're going to use up the remaining fuel to try to get it focused on those. Uh, we do want to look at some other Kuiper Belt objects, especially now that we've looked at Pluto. And we don't know. That's one of the really big questions. Again, Pluto's one data point. Is Pluto really something different, which would, again, be kind of very ironic given the whole discussion about planet status. Is it really something different? And are the rest of the Kuiper Belt objects really like dirty snowballs or comets? Or will we find something just as interesting on other Kuiper Belt objects? Uh, that's, that's a great question. I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry I'm drawing a blank on when it will get to the next Kuiper Belt object. It's not something that's going to happen in the next year. I mean, it's going to be a while. There's... You know, there's a lot of space. There's a lot of, I always say there's a lot of space in space. So these, these objects are, are pretty far apart, right? Even though it kind of looks like when you, when you look, when you look at, uh, when you look at the, the pictures of uh, like, just like the asteroid belt, you know, you see all that, you see this really thick ring because of the scale. But if you were to like fly through the asteroid belt with a Kuiper belt, it's not like uh, in Star Wars where you're kind of like, shh, shh, you know, like, Zooming around the rocks, you have to you have to really kind of work to hit something, right? You know, there's a lot of space in space. So, <laughs> Mr. Keefe, sir. Uh, just to comment, uh, the round trip light time according to the New Horizons website is nine hours twenty five minutes. Okay, nine hours twenty five minutes is the round trip light time. Yeah, so that that four and a half hours. Uh, a little different than the Voyagers, where the round trip light time is well in excess of twenty four right now. Frank. Is there any chance that Walt Disney could force NASA to change Absolutely. the name of Pluto to something else because Disney probably has a copyright on the document? So, so that's, a, that's, a, that's actually, uh, it, that's probably a question that people think about. Is there any way Walt Disney could actually 
you know, go after NASA for calling it Pluto. Uh, well, there's two, there's a couple things. First of all, uh, NASA didn't do that. That's uh, by convention of the International International Astronomical Union. But second of all, from all the data, all the research that people have done, Pluto historians, there's been a lot of it in the last few years since it's been a really big deal about whether Pluto is a planet, is the name Pluto, the dog, came after the name. And Pluto it's the Pluto, was the, Pluto was the god of the underworld, uh, and it was actually a name suggested by uh, Venetia Burney, uh, an 11 year old girl in England actually suggested the name because they had a contest when they discovered Pluto they had a contest for the names because Percival Lowell's widow was out there and she wanted to call it things like Constance which by a staggering coincidence was her first name um, <laughs> you know and uh, there were a lot of really crazy suggestions and they had a contest and uh, uh, Venetia Burney's grandfather was um, I think he was a librarian at Oxford or he was somehow plugged in uh, to the academic scene. And he basically challenged her, come up with a name and I'll send it in. And if you do, I'll give you five pounds, which at the time was a lot of money. Um, you know. And she, she, did, she went to the library you know, with him and she did a bunch of research and she came up with Pluto, which kind of fit in really well with the, the whole scheme of the gods and the fact that it was so out there and, and, and suggested it. And they actually picked the name and she did get the five pounds. I, ironically, she just died just a couple of years ago. So uh, uh, she she lived you know long enough to, to at least see the New Horizons launch, but not enough to see the spacecraft get there. So that, that's a long answer to the question. Forty gigabytes don't seem all that much up there. It doesn't seem like all that much, but it's actually a lot of data for the raw data. Yeah, I know. Uh, the thing is that yours isn't operating at, at, uh, at almost absolute zero and uh, also not in a, in a heavy radiation environment. So the, uh, uh, the, the processors and everything they use there are usually special RAD hardened. Like uh, a lot of times they use PowerPC processors. They use the IBM 750 RADs that are actually hardened for space. And like the Curiosity rover has a massively powerful one. It's like 200 megahertz. That's massively powerful compared to anything else that's ever gone up, right? So the, the, the computer's not fast. Uh, it's meant to be reliable because you, can't, you know, can't send a service tech out. You can't call uh, Geek Squad to come fix it. So are, are there any other questions? Uh, there are years of study ahead. The data, when it comes back, won't be cut and dry. There'll be a lot of people, you know, again, getting PhD thesis and studying the data and pulling things out. I mean, we're going to be learning things for years. Uh, about Pluto, and you'll see lots of, lots of theories. Um, we think there's a lot of exciting things in the future, and personally, I can hardly wait. I just I love the outer solar system much more than anything. I, I love to I love, love to learn more about it. Mike, sure. That's a good question. The power source on the New Horizons. It's actually what they call an RTG or radioisotope thermal generator, uh, and it's uh, plutonium uh, 238. Uh, and so basically the nuclear, it basically it relies on the nuclear decay, which generates heat. And that's actually turned, that actually has, a, there's actually thermal couples in there that turn that heat into electricity. It's not very efficient. For about 1,000 watts of heat, you get about 100 watts of power. It will run for a very long time. The Voyagers use the same technology. And, you know, here they are. They're, they were launched in the 70s, and they're still running. However, in the Voyager's case, it's already dropped down to about 20 watts. <laughs> it will lose efficiency. Well, yeah, so the, the question is, once you pass Jupiter, solar panels don't work very well. That's correct. You don't get enough sunlight. You'd have to make them very big. Uh, but additionally, the reason they have to be so big is not just the power requirements of spacecraft, but you have to keep the electronics warm. You have to have some heat. So you'd have to have even more solar panels where the RTGs, one of the byproducts is actually heat that can actually be used to heat the spacecraft. So. So I'm glad you bring that up. There are some really good Pluto apps uh, that they put out for smartphones. So if you have a smartphone or an I, I, iPad or uh, an Android tablet, uh, you can actually get some really cool apps. There's some really good Pluto apps out there. 
and uh, they'll, they'll keep adding to them. I also recommend, if you're interested in following this, go to the Pluto website. There's, a, there's the, the NASA New Horizons site on NASA, but on, uh, there's a link on there to the, the primary investigators uh, site, or the, or the sponsoring institution is Johns Hopkins. They have a dedicated Pluto site. Uh, it seems to have uh, a little more technical information, and it's really interesting. And they have a blog that they post in like pretty much every two or three days with some kind of new facts that they're learning. So, uh, and they, with a lot of good references. So, if you're interested, I really encourage you to go to that site because that that news archives that they're putting out is is, is actually really interesting. So, what's the name of that site again? Uh, it's. You'll have to do New Horizons Pluto and look at the, uh, when you do a Google, and you'll see one that's at John Hopkins. That's the site. It's uh, John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. Yeah. There's, I think it's Pluto uh, APL or Pluto JH APL or something. Uh, yes, question? Yeah, that's a really good question, and I honestly don't know the answer to it. Uh, the question is that it's a spin, it's a spin-off question, and uh, the question is: Is there technology developed for New Horizons that we could use here on Earth? And that's a that's a good question. I, I know the cameras are so much better. Um, I mean, okay. So Steve is uh, Steve Izzo is talking about, and I'm repeating what you're saying so because we are, I am recording this on my laptop, so that's why people need to hear it. Uh, he's saying that the, cam, uh, the pixel density and some of the imaging technology they use, which is, you know, we launched this thing in 19, what, 1996, so, but some of, the, some of the technology they developed for that is, you know, went into the commercial technology, so that's not unusual to see that, because these guys that are designing the spacecraft really are kind of way out there on the edge. Well, hey, thanks for asking a lot of great questions. I, I hope it was uh, semi-useful to everybody. You sound very, very interested. All the pictures you saw right there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, sorry, you can't take your backdoor telescope to see these. These are only available for NASA. Okay, so thank you for an outstanding talk. Oh, thank you. And I think we may need a, an update.